off-highway vehicle recreation is booming. In 1972, there were an estimated 5 million vehicles in use. By 2004, that number had grown to 51 million. The numbers are much higher now. This creates unprecedented pressure on public lands. In response to this growth, the U.S. Forest Service established a rule to govern travel management in our national forests in 2005. OHV travel in national forests has created conflict between user groups. I have seen personally people chasing elk up one hill and down the other. We have seen people that were, uh, that you just talked about, cutting cookies in the meadow in the springtime, just ripping it up. Everyone's seen the commercials on television where the ATV rider or the four-wheeler goes out and they bog through all the mud and it looks like a hell of a lot of fun. Who would want to do that? I mean, television makes it look very, very appealing. And that's the main focus, I feel, of the average ATV rider. They are not out there to go, oh, a butterfly. Oh, look at the pines. Look at the beautiful green meadows. Let's stop and have a break and have lunch and absorb all this. No, it's all about vroom, 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 and go, go, go. Resource damage is the primary focus of this recreational uh, use. According to the way it's promoted, there's over a thousand miles or nearly that in Central Oregon already of OHV trails. Now it's being promoted that, uh, at least when they advertise this, that that's more than any place in the nation in this area. So why do you need more here if you can't enforce what we got? Over the years, we've, we've provided numerous comments to the Forest Service related to road density and the disturbance on, uh, on elk populations, and specifically the elk populations um, in the Ochoa Wildlife Management Unit. This is an illegal road in the Umatilla National Forest where cross-country travel has been banned. This road was closed, but off-roaders drove around the closure and continued to use it. A berm was then established to block travel. OHV riders ignored the blockade and established illegal roads from either side to access the closed road. And we have what appears to be over 100 yards of access road that has been built in illegally into a campsite here near critical wetlands. It's critically important for us to actually have these roads shut down to protect the, the habitat of not only the wetlands but for the wildlife that are in the area. You know, as the native people of this region, we've been living on this landscape for 10,000 years. We've been managing this landscape before the Forest Service was managing it, and they were managed for conservation values to ensure the protection of those wildlife species, to ensure the protection of those medicines and first foods. So here we are. Here's a perfect example of uh, 10 minutes of fun in an ATV or a four-wheeler uh, right on the edge of the meadow and through this portion of the meadow. Uh, we're talking about taxpayer dollars. So for 10 minutes of fun, we're going to spend literally thousands of taxpayer dollars on our ecologists to come do restoration effort on this. And then on top of that, they, uh, they drop pieces off of their, their bike and from their gear in the back, leaving it behind. The, the ideals of leave no trace uh, are extremely important in the forest. We know that, that high road densities impact big game security, particularly for elk and anything over about a half a mile per square mile uh, is going to have degraded elk security. So from time to time the Forest Service enacts road closures like this to create large blocks of secure habitat. Even at that, we have right here adjacent to it two places where they've pioneered new roads. Forest Service last year took care of the first one with some boulders placement at taxpayers expense and it took them less than a year to go around that with another pioneered road to get around a gate that clearly is demarked as a closed road. So we have here through a huckleberry patch, it looks like a UTV road, it's about the width of a UTV. Um, it comes right up and around the end of the gate. We can spend our tax dollars making fences and barriers or we can provide restricted access through closures that are much more dramatic than 
this simple road closure here. So this is a classic example of an old skid road that has now been maintained as an ATV trail and it cuts deep into a large track of secure elk habitat. A road like this does, uh, once it's put in place, it takes many years to naturally recover. Mm -hmm. And if we have continuing use uh, uh, by vehicles, it will never recover. It continues to deliver sediment to the stream systems and it continues to provide access into a secure elk wintering area. You know, ATVs, which are, are fun vehicles, and I've ridden many of them myself, four-wheelers, three-wheelers as a kid. Uh, but prior to that, coming into these mountains, we came by horseback. You would come to a trailhead or into a main road that has been sanctioned by the United States Forest Service as an access road, and then ride in horseback into these mountains and canyons. With the advent of these vehicles, uh, people believe that they could go the same places that horses could go. The issue with that is that horses are a low impact vehicle to get you into the, into the back country. These ATVs are huge impact vehicles and I think that uh, while they may be fun and they're fun to drive around, people don't really fully understand that they are creating roads that will last a thousand years. I understand totally people's comments about damage to the resources and ruts and meadows and and the things that go on to destroy the resources. And I share those concerns, but when those individuals paint me with that same brush, when they tell me that because I have one of these things that I am part of that community that's tearing up the world, they need to try to understand there are other people out there. And not everybody's like an ad on TV with four-wheelers crashing through mud puddles. The Wallowa Whitman National Forest is Oregon's largest national forest. And yet it doesn't have a modern, a modern travel management plan. There are over 9,000 miles of roads in this forest. It is one of the most road-dense forests in the United States. You have to ask yourself, do we need a road every half mile to have access to these public lands? And the answer to that is obviously no. If we were to reduce some of the road densities and the road redundancies here in the Northwest in this forest, elk herds would, would thrive much better uh, we would have healthier herds, uh, we would have elk herds still on public lands and not moving to the private lands that are surrounding this national forest. We have a lot of roads on our forest and uh, uh, many, many of them were built uh, for timber sales uh, and it's difficult to keep track of all of them because they get added in over time. Um, and right now we're working on an existing condition map that uses uh, all the information that we had in our database plus uh, the counties and, uh, and our user groups and individuals have provided us a lot of information about uh, roads that are out there um, and our own employees have added to that so we hope to have our existing condition map out soon uh, and there's still um, a large number of roads that will be colored gray on that map because we don't really know the status of that road. Nobody's reported anything recently about it. So some of those roads will be roads that you're talking about that are maybe grown in. You can have some good sized trees coming up in those roads because they haven't been used for decades. They absolutely are not sure what roads they have. They're not sure which ones for sure are still open or which ones have closed themselves. I, have, I had a conversation just last night with uh, the four supervisor for the Wallowa Whitman, and he invited me to look at their new maps to see if they represent what's actually on the ground. Now, and I told him I would be happy to be part of that, but that in itself, uh, indicates to me that they're still after information on what the actual on-the-ground situation is. Larry Cribbs has spent his life in the Umatilla and Wallowa Whitman National Forests. As a boy, he hunted and fished here. 
There are countless lakes, stunning meadows, deep canyons, and mountains. There are thousands of miles of rivers, providing clean water. There is magnificent color. This land is home to descendants of the Nez Perce, Umatilla, Cayuse, and Walla Walla native people. There are Rocky Mountain elk. There are black bear, moose, bighorn sheep, mountain goats, white-tailed, and mule deer. Predators include a growing presence of wolves, bobcat, coyotes, and as seen here, cougar. There is still a ranch influence, old corrals and fences. Cattle graze in these forests, so do sheep. Larry Cribbs wants to retain full access to what he's had, to what he loves. He opposes a massive reduction of roads. This is the add-on muffler. We've left the original one on behind. When we go riding, it's an extra muffler silencer that we put on. You carry a fire extinguisher probably on both these, don't you? Both machines have one. And uh, this machine up here, we have uh, first aid kits. We have tire repair kits. The thing that keeps you from going out there and make a mess out of things and tearing up the real estate is common sense and uh, integrity. And then a lot of the places, some of them I'm going to show you today, if you were silly enough to get off of a trail or off of a road, you're going to die because it's straight down. I mean, it just the geography does doesn't lend itself to that kind of travel. It's seldom you see anybody out here behaving like an idiot. If you these these weigh 800 pounds, they'll go 45, 50 miles an hour, and if you behave like an idiot, you're probably going to end up in the hospital. So you've probably just eliminated part of the problem you're causing. I'm bringing you through ground out here that I've traveled for over 50 years. And you can't show me, I can't show you, except where I stayed the nights and where my boys kill the animals and where my dad is. And you can't tell I've been there unless I tell you. That's got to count for something. In 2012, the Wallawa Whitman National Forest ruled that nearly 4,000 miles of roads would be closed. There was massive opposition, and the Forest Service would rescind the closure plan. You know, if, if you look at the history of the National Forest here, uh, they used to provide a lot of jobs here. I mean, when, when they were cutting timber, it went into the mills and it provided a lot of jobs. Well, with the, with the salmon listing in this part of the world, spotted owl on the west side, that doesn't happen anymore. I mean, the amount of timber we get out of these forests is just minuscule from what it used to be. So, the locals have always used it for recreation. If you understand the geography of northeast Oregon, it's three or four mountain valleys surrounded by forest service lands, okay? Uh, the valleys are owned or private ownership, so the natural recreation has always been in the forest service. And if you look at the, the locals around here, every one of them has a favorite hunting place, fishing place, huckleberry patch, mushroom place. I mean, they all do. And to come in now after you've eliminated the economic piece of it and then go ahead and eliminate the, the access piece, that was a real hard slap in the face of this community. What happened was when the Umatilla did their forest plan, they put travel management in their plan, every place but the Hefner Ranger District. Well, our women didn't. So what happened was, is as people wanted to do ATV recreation or whatever, off-road recreation, you wouldn't go to the Umatilla, you'd come to the Wallow Whitman. Because the Wallow Whitman essentially had no regulations at all. You could go off-road, you'd go wherever you want to. And then to go through a process that completely shut that down as tight as it did, it was a real shock to a lot of people. We had people from outside the area that came to these meetings. I mean, it was, it was a huge piece. 
The other piece of it was the way the Forest Service did it. You know, they never took the time to go out and find out what existing conditions were, okay? The counties did that. They came out and said they were going to close all the maintenance level one roads across the board, okay? And plus some level twos. And they said, well, if you guys want some of them left open, you need to go out and show us which ones they are and why you want them left over open, and then we will consider leaving them open. So Wallow County, for example, they had 30 volunteers with their own vehicles, their own money. They drove every one of those roads, and they found almost 50% of those roads, not quite, had already grown out and already closed themselves down naturally. And rocks had gone across them, trees had gone across them. They were no longer viable roads. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, the Wallow Whitman did not do a good job in when they closed the road, they wouldn't close it. You know, they didn't go in and tank trap it or close it. They would leave them open so people would keep using them. And so they didn't really know uh, what they had out there. So they went through what I consider to be a, a map exercise. You know, we'll solve this problem of not knowing what our conditions are by just closing the whole thing down. Okay. So we went through a process where we started inventory roads and do just like everybody else did. Um, we came down to four, four particular requests that we had made of areas that we want left open. We gave the reasons that we wanted them left open and we put them in our, in our uh, uh, comments to the Forest Service. We wanted the, 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 the number three alternative. It was the Wallow County alternative, which was simply the roads that are grown over, we'll shut those down, leave the rest of them open for ATV and use, and we'll go from there. And on top of that, we identified four specific areas and, and gave the reason. And uh, two weeks before the, uh, the decision came down, uh, the district ranger in Legrand called me and said, hey, counties aren't getting anything. I mean, they're not giving you anything. I mean, they just flat closed the door on all of our requests. All, after all the effort we made on all three communities, I had a commissioner from Baker County said, Boy, I wish we'd have been like Union County and not done a damn thing. He said, we didn't get anything, and we made all that effort, and we didn't get a thing out of it. There was a lot of people that were upset about it. A lot of us in leadership felt betrayed, you know. I mean, we were expecting that the Forest Service was going to give us some kind of a response. Didn't get a thing. In eastern Oregon, the Wallowa Whitman National Forest Travel Management Plan is really what prompted this legislation and, uh, and, and similar planning failures along the way that caused me to introduce this bill. From the beginning, local communities and volunteers dedicated countless hours of personal time traveling, documenting the roads, communicating their needs to agencies, officials. But at the end of the process, they developed comments and put forth suggestions on roads that weren't being used that could be closed, but also pointed out roads that are popular, necessary, and needed to remain open. In 2012, when agency officials rolled out the final plan, more than 4,000 miles of roads were slated for closure, 4,000 miles, on a forest where a quarter of the land, some 600,000 acres, is already designated wilderness. You can't drive there. In Wallowa County alone, over 70% of the national forest is already shut off to motorized recreation. 70% of the national forest already shut down. In what amounted to an assault on good process and rural traditions on public lands, it was clear to those who participated in the process that the Forest Service had largely, if not entirely, ignored the thoughtful and deliberate input that they got in this planning process. Having faced years of declining timber harvest and the resulting unemployment and, frankly, rural poverty created by lack of management on our federal lands, the agency, frankly, ignored local citizens. And at one point, close to 1,000 citizens in a small rural county, or three counties in this case, turned out to protest the arrogance of the Forest Service. And I don't use that term lightly, and Ms. Weldon and I go back a long ways when she was on the Deschutes Forest. This was a travesty. The tribes have uh, met with uh, Congressman Walden's staff. We've also uh, submitted testimony uh, to the appropriate committees as they're reviewing this legislation. And we just strongly disagree with, with Congressman Walden. We believe that uh, the management plan has to be held uh, with the Forest Service who has that trust responsibility and that government-government relationship So, because that's who we consult with. We don't believe that the counties should have final say in these. We don't wish to harm the counties in any way. We believe that uh, local government rule is important, but in this case, the Forest Service is owned by all the Americans. 
across the United States, all American interests. So it doesn't matter if uh, people are coming here from New Hampshire for the first time into the Blue Mountains, into the Umatilla National Forest, or you're having somebody locally coming in from Hefner. What we want is consistent ruling and consistent lawmaking that will protect for conservation values these forest systems. So we're here on the Starkey Experimental Research Station high in the Blue Mountains of Oregon. This is an iconic setting. Some of the best elk habitat in the entire world is right here. And this Starkey Research Center is probably the world's best known research center for elk and deer. For the modern science of managing these elk and deer herds that roam the entire West and throughout uh, North America. In the last 20 years, there have been numerous studies going on which show that uh, roaded areas and road densities have a major impact on elk herds uh, here in the West. The result of too many roads is very obvious. Elk don't like it. They split. They go for safer quarters. Ironically, on my way here today, I saw many elk herds on private land. And that means one thing. You have very little or probably no access whatsoever. Hunters are shut out. And so you, you've got that push-pull thing. You're pushing them off the public land. And that's where the travel management comes in. And then those guys are planting something they like and irrigating it. You know, so <clears throat> they're contributing to it. But they, you know, their idea is, well, I have a right to farm, you know. And that seems to make sense to most people, you know. But they are, you go out in the desert somewhere, whatever county, Harney County, Mount Hare County, any, this is the edge of it out here, you know, and you have a desert and you put in an irrigated alfalfa field, something's going to use it, whether it's antelope, deer, elk, you know, that's just what's going to happen. It might take a few years for them to find it, but they will. They do come down. I suppose part of the problem uh, that is created is the public uh, using the roads on the Forest Service land now, but uh, Certainly, uh, uh, it, it's a management thing. And if we just manage the land, why we can overcome the problems that there are. But uh, it's just really difficult uh, when there is no management on uh, either private or public lands. We use uh, all-terrain vehicles, ATVs, uh, here on the ranch uh, ourselves. Uh, our, my personal concern with ATVs is uh, the spread of noxious weeds. I think there should be wash stations established where those uh, machines can be washed and uh, uh, before they enter the forest and uh, after they uh, b before they leave the forest. But uh, there's a place for them, but they do they do need to be managed. I have 2,000 head of cattle on Summit Prairie and they don't stampede when I drive through with my four-wheeler, but I can tell you the 250 head of elk that are there, they always stampede no matter how quiet I am and they tear the fences down and they, they, uh, they cause much more havoc than the cattle do. The cattle just stand and look at me when I, when I drive through the cattle, but, but uh, their point was pretty well taken. I know we can get there. We have a, we have a forest collaborative uh, on this forest now. Many forests uh, have forest collaboratives. And I've seen the Malheur Forest, I think, has been working together, uh, bringing together a group of diverse people who are interested in forest management for about 10 years, I believe. And they've made tremendous progress in uh, a range of people who are, on the one hand, uh, very interested in the timber industry and the jobs and the, uh, the well-being for the community that, that uh, those jobs bring and on the other hand, environmental uh, organizations who are quite concerned about forest management from a point of view of, of uh, protecting the resource. And those groups work together quite effectively now. In our own collaborative here that's about a year and a half old, we're making some real progress in being able to talk to each other and tell those stories about why it's important. So I see it happening in forest management, and I think the same thing can happen in recreation, it can happen in travel. And it has to do, I think, with making sure that we have all the voices in the room at the same time and that we uh, have uh, frank but respectful conversations about our, uh, about our opinions. Mm -hmm. And if we do that, I'm very optimistic that we can 
solve almost any problem. And for the Forest Service, it's critical that we have this collaboration because of our multiple use mission. And we have, a, we have our mission to steward the resource. At the same time, we have a recreation mission and a, and a, uh, a group of users who want to be out in the forest. Uh, it's public land and, and we all have a say in how it's managed. I'm a citizen of this. This is my home. Now I've got a house someplace else, but this is my home. And I do everything I can to take care of it. So was this different when I was a boy? Sure it was. But I looked at it as a boy. And now I'm anything but a boy and I'm looking at the same thing I looked at over 60 years ago, grass, trees, cattle, water. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we've done too bad. And I want to talk about this meeting is really not about four-wheelers to me, it's not about motorcycles, and it's not about uh, uh, access to the forest, it's about responsible use. I mean, we got all of this stuff out there already anyway. It's the irresponsible use that's going on that's causing us all the problems. It's, a, it's just a great privilege to have these lands. It really is. And I see it coming from a place that didn't have it. You know, and I, I think we've got to be good custodians of it, really and truly. And nobody's going to get everything they want. And, you know, it's never going to be like it was in 1950 again, you know, and stuff like that. But, but still, we're so fortunate to have these public lands that are pretty wild, really. Uh, our uh, first chief of the Forest Service, Gifford Pinchot, said, uh, you know, when it comes to making a decision, it should be the greatest good for the greatest number in the long haul. And we take that pretty seriously. I don't think the people involved in this travel management controversy and discussion, none of us want to lose our public lands. I know that. We've got a lot of things in common, really. A lot of them are hunters, like I said before. And we all want to be able to hunt and have quality hunting and we want to have freedoms, and we do have a lot of freedom here. But we've got to, you know, we've got to have some responsibility, and we've got to have, um, we've got to be able to limit ourselves a little bit.